is uh, you'll be even more energized. Good morning. This is uh, I am Mike Petrilli of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. Uh, for those of you who are new to Fordham, perhaps because uh, you focus on pre-K and this is an issue that we don't cover a whole lot of, uh, we are one of the nation's leading education policy think tanks. Uh, we do what think tanks do in Washington, D.C. We issue reports and we blog and we comment on the education news of the day. One thing that makes us unique, though, is that we also do on-the-ground work in the great state of Ohio, where we have offices in Dayton, our hometown, as well as in Columbus. Uh, we do things like charter, uh, authorized charter schools and get involved in policy debates at the state level. Uh, so a shout out to our friends in Ohio that are watching today as well. Uh, we're really excited to be having this debate today on preschool and specifically on the president's preschool proposal. Uh, as you know, in his State of the Union address, President Obama placed this new pre-K initiative high on his wish list for his second term and also put pre-K back in the middle of the education reform conversation. So today we are going to discuss and debate his plan, but we're also going to talk about some of the larger issues surrounding the preschool issue. Now, this is not something that Fordham has focused on a whole lot, uh, mostly because our mission is very specifically the reform of the K-12 system. Uh, but anyone who has spent more than a minute thinking about education reform uh, knows that kids' experiences between the time they are born and the time they enter kindergarten at age five matter a whole lot in terms of how well they're going to do once they're in school. And I would say that even hardened cynics would concede that high-quality preschool programs could make a dent in our mile-wide achievement gaps and help low-income students get ready for school. The question, though, is always how do you define quality and how do you get to it at scale? And then there's other questions as well. Who should provide preschool? Should it be school districts uh, so that they can align that with their other uh, programs? Uh, should charter schools be in the mix? Uh, churches, for-profit companies? And what does the research say on all of these points? Uh, what can we learn from current federal efforts, especially the big federal effort in this space, Head Start? And what can we learn from state initiatives, especially some of the newer state initiatives out there? Is there a federal role in pre-K and why? And if we think there is, how can we convince lawmakers that in this era of high deficits and these big budget battles, we should spend even more on pre-K programs than we do now? So to debate all of this, we have two of the country's leading experts on pre-K policy and practice, Sarah Mead and Russ Whitehurst. And I'm really thrilled that they agreed to participate in this. Sarah Mead is a principal with Bellwether Education Partners. And prior to joining Bellwether, she directed the New America Foundation's Early Education Initiative, has done similar work at many other think tanks around town. And Sarah will be joined with, by Russ Whitehurst, who's director of the Brown Center on Education Policy at the Brookings Institution. Previously, he was the founding director of the Institute of Education Sciences, and before that, in his academic career, he published groundbreaking work on early literacy. So these two are no strangers to this topic. Uh, our debate's going to have two segments, and we're really going to treat this as a debate. Okay, We're going to try not just a panel. This is a debate. Um, the first segment of the debate, I'm going to have Sarah and Russ describe what they see as the ideal federal pre-K policy. Okay, so they're not going to specifically address the president's plan quite yet. Uh, I'd like them to address some of the issues like universal pre-K versus targeted programs, programs that are targeted at the poor. Uh, what to do with Head Start, since it is the big federal effort in this space already, uh, as well as what should any new programs look like. And then in the second segment, I'll ask them to weigh in on the specifics of the president's plan, what are the pros and cons, and is it worth supporting? I don't mean to give it away, but I suspect there will be more agreement in that second segment, at least based on some of the things that Russ uh, and Sarah have written. And then uh, we'll do some rebuttals. I'll ask some questions. We'll open it up to the audience. Uh, online audience, please get in the action here. You can tweet your questions to hashtag pre-K debate. Okay, and I do have my trusty iPhone here. I'm not checking my email. I am following along on Twitter so I can make sure the online audience gets in as well. Okay, so those of you here live, enjoy your juice boxes and animal crackers, as I will be doing. Those at home, go ahead, go to the fridge and steal some of your kids as well. Uh, let's get started, Sarah, 10 minutes on what you see as the ideal federal pre-K policy. Let's get started. Sure, thank you, Mike. Um, 
So in education, we deal every day with issues where we honestly don't know the answer and where research is not helpful to understanding what we should do. Pre-K is not one of those issues. The body of evidence suggesting that high quality early childhood education can have significant positive impacts on children's lives and that those results can be sustained is one of the strongest bodies of research that we have to draw on in any education policy area we work in. We have gold standard randomized controlled trials, not just the well-known Perry Preschool study, but more recently from a large-scale state preschool program in Tennessee. We also have uh, regression discontinuity studies now from several states around the country finding similar positive results for children's learning, not just in the early years, but in some cases going on into elementary school as well. We also have some well-designed quasi-empirical studies from um, you know, Chicago Perry Preschool Program from Texas that similarly are finding positive results, again, sustained over time. So when we look at this body of evidence, we are seeing positive effects for kids from participation in preschool in settings as diverse as New Jersey's urban districts and Texas's rural communities. And we are seeing evidence that those gains in the right context can be sustained at least into the early elementary grades. We also have a really robust body of research, some of which Russ has contributed to, about how young children learn and the types of experiences that enable them to succeed. So we know a lot about what we should actually be doing in preschool programs to deliver those results. So the issue that we have in preschool policy in this country is not an issue of evidence or an issue of research. It's an issue of execution. Over and over and over again, we know what we should do, but we are failing to do it. And to some extent, asking if preschool works is like asking if charter schools work. The question is not, it's a big policy reform, and there's huge variations in how it's implemented. So you have to look at the specific case of the implementation, not just at the big scale picture. So why don't we do what works often in early childhood education and what we know is good for kids? Several reasons. One is just an issue of access. About one in three poor children and one in three children generally get no preschool experience despite the evidence of its value. Um, so sort of related to that, even when children get those experiences, too often they are not delivering the quality of what we know children need to get in those preschool programs to be well prepared to succeed in school. There's several reasons for that. One is simply an issue of resources. We're not putting significant resources into many of the programs that are serving children. Second issue is that there's not been any concerted effort to build the supply of quality providers so that we have good providers available for all children. Um, then sort of equally important, though, is that our expectations are far too low, both for kids and for programs. We don't have high enough expectations often of what our children should be learning based on evidence when they're three and four years old, nor do we actually have high enough expectations for what the quality of those programs should be and the types of intentional activities they should be doing to promote children's learning. And partly that reflects just a lack of consensus on what the goals for these programs should be. Now the issue here is that these are all actually programs that we can fix and that we know how to fix. There is an issue of resources in how we fix those problems that we do need to work through, but we know how to resolve those problems. I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of what an ideal early childhood policy would look like. And I think before we go to what would the ideal federal policy look like, we have to look at what do we actually want for our children. And so I believe that in an ideal world, we would have high quality universal preschool available to all children at least at four years old and probably also available to three-year-olds with significant needs. We should do this through a system of public education as a core part of that system, but in a system that, consistent with many of the reforms we're pursuing in K-12, is premised on diverse delivery using a variety of providers with common accountability for those providers to high standards and to delivering outcomes for children. So why universal, just for, for a quick second since Mike asked about that, Obviously, in a context where our resources are limited, we should be targeting those resources first to the most disadvantaged and the neediest children. And if we are operating with limited resources, it's better to serve a smaller number of children in a truly high quality program than to spread those resources thin so we're serving everybody in programs that aren't up to snuff. 
The um, issue, though, is that that's really a political question, what the level of resources is. And I think there are good arguments for why we should focus on getting the resources to the point where we can actually serve all children. The body of evidence from this country on programs for middle class kids is very limited, largely because we don't have a lot of programs that are serving that population of kids that have been subject to research. Where we do have the evidence in Oklahoma shows significant positive impacts for middle class children as well as low income children in preschool. We also know from other study, from countries, studies that have been conducted in other countries that there's some evidence there. And we should take seriously the sort of market evidence that affluent parents, parents with incomes over $100,000, virtually universally use those resources to procure quality preschool for those kids. All evidence that people really do believe those programs work for middle class and affluent as well as low income kids. There's also just practical reasons why we should be looking to universal rather than targeted pre-K programs as our long term goal. The reality is that if we target preschool programs to only low income kids, we're still talking about nearly half of children under the age of five given the demographics in this country. Um, and that, that's just a consideration when we talk about the benefits of targeted un versus universal. There are also um, Targeting itself can be imperfect. It's not, there are not easy ways to necessarily identify which population of kids we want to be focusing on. Young families in particular often have significant fluctuations in their income. And universal programs have some real benefits in terms of our ability to align the experiences children get in preschool with those experiences in the elementary school grades when all the kindergarten teachers can know that many preschool children have had a common set of experiences going in. They're much better able to take advantage of the benefits of preschool and build on them as opposed to when they're sort of triaging for kids who haven't had preschool and trying to sort out even where the children have been beforehand. The other issue that we should really take into account in thinking about universal preschool is that the market is failing middle class families in a number of communities. It's not delivering either the quality or the supply of preschool that middle class families are seeking even when they're willing and able to pay. So what should the federal role in getting to this universal system be? Um, I think one of the things when we talk about the federal role in, in preschool that we need to take into account is that the federal role in the status quo is different in early childhood than it is in K-12. In K-12, the federal government is very much a backseat driver that's trying to move policy change. The federal government only provides about 10% of K-12 spending. In early childhood, it's very different. The federal government provides the majority of public spending that's going to early childhood right now, and any effort to think about what federal policy would look like in an ideal system has to take that into account. That said, I think to move to the system that we would like to see of universal preschool we do need to move towards a greater state role, a greater local role in the actual delivery and funding of these programs to make them sustainable over time and to ensure quality. Um, what, what should the federal be, government be doing to drive in that direction? One thing the federal government should be doing is incenting state policy change. And I think that's really the core of the Obama proposal that we'll talk about later, is trying to incent states to be making the investments that they need to be making in order to create much broader access to quality preschool. The second thing that the federal government can and should be doing in early childhood is really supporting a concerted effort to build the supply of quality providers. In order to serve all kids in quality programs, we need to dramatically increase the number of providers that exist who have the capability of delivering really exemplary experiences for kids. The federal government is doing that in K-12 with the charter schools program, has had a huge impact on building quality supply in the K-12 space, should be doing the same thing in early childhood. We should also recognize that some of the most powerful positive examples of research-based interventions in the early childhood years actually come out of federal research. So classroom assessment scoring system started with NIH-funded research. Um, the Texas School Ready program started with a combination of IES and NIH money. So, so the federal government's already doing this, but they need to do a much better job there. Um, and then finally, the federal government needs to take a careful look at some of the things it's doing and get out of the way 
of efforts to improve system alignment and efforts to improve quality. I mean, the irony of the Early Learning Challenge Grant Program was that the federal government put a bunch of money on the table for states to better align their early childhood systems when federal rules in Head Start and federal rules in child care were one of the major barriers to things states really wanted to do to improve that alignment. And so if the federal government wants to incent states to do better in preschool, it needs to look at its own efforts that are currently standing in the way there. So what does that mean for Head Start, since you asked about that? Um, I do think that Head Start sometimes gets a bum rap, um, particularly in K-12 reform circles. It is not a program that is anywhere near as well as it needs to be, but it is producing progress during the time children are in the program, and there's pretty clear evidence that those children are in better situations than they would be without that program. That does not, by any circumstances, mean that it's good enough. For us to achieve the results we want for kids, we need to do better, and we need to do better across the board, but I think people need to take that into account. In sort of my ideal federal policy, we would move Head Start in the direction that we've already started to move towards a much more charter school-like model with a very clear focus on school readiness. That would mean that programs would get more flexibility in how they deliver the program. They would have fewer requirements to address the wide range of areas they're currently responsible for to enable them to focus more on content and outcomes that really drive school readiness. But we'd have real standards for those programs' performance, and it would mean that low-performing providers would go out of business. Again, for that to happen, what needs to happen is a simultaneous concerted effort to build the supply of quality early childhood providers. We've had this Head Start recompete. A number of low-performing grantees will not lose their grants because there was nobody better to compete for those grants. That is a travesty and it is a huge lost policy opportunity that the early childhood funding community, the federal government, states, and local school districts need to really learn from and step up in efforts to build quality supply in this space. Um, the issue there, there could potentially be, I think, an increased state role in a charter-like system like that, but I think it would need to include real attention to what is state's demonstrated track record of both commitment and quality execution in their own early childhood program states have a history of being bad actors in this space, of trying to come up with any way they can minimize the amount of money they're spending and reallocate spending when they get it. And we need to be very careful of that, particularly given state cuts in recent years. Um, what we shouldn't do is just get rid of the Head Start program, given that lack of funding for quality supply is the biggest barrier to building quality supply, and Head Start is still the biggest and most robust funding stream for quality early childhood education. I'm not sure if it comes through in my comments here, but I'm frequently very frustrated by the current state of our early childhood conversation because I feel like we spend a lot of time focusing on sort of stupid debates around things that are sort of at the periphery of this. So Not here this morning, <laughs> thankfully. Yes. I mean, even though sometimes the way we frame, um, you know, what the federal role should be or universal versus targeted or we get sidetracked into, you know, very obscure sort of methodological disputes about the studies. The reality is that we know a lot about what works for kids. We know what we would need to actually do as a society in order to make sure that more kids get that. Um, the issue is that we don't have the will to do it, and that's just inexcusable. We are the richest country in the world. There are other countries that are much less um, affluent than we are and that are even in some ways less functional as governments than we are and still manage to do this for our kids, we can do this. Um, education reform is tackling audacious challenges every day. This should be one of the ones we're going after. Okay, thank you. All right, Russ, uh, Sarah says we know what to do. We just need the political will. The research is clear. It's an execution problem. What do you say? 10 minutes. Mike wants to set this up as a debate. But, um. <laughs> yes, I do. I, and by the way, if you hear if you hear some punches thrown, I want the audience to cheer. We have to incentivize our panelists here. All right. let, let, let me let me deal with the uh, debate issues first. Uh, there are more things that Sarah and I agree about than we disagree about. I think we disagree on how definitive the research is. Uh, I think that there is enough research to know that uh, children who are particularly uh, disadvantaged and behind on the types of things that can be learned at home uh, from involved uh, educated parents uh, can benefit from center-based experiences that uh, give them 
those dispositions, the skills, the knowledge with which other children routinely show up at, at the schoolhouse door. I think the research on that is clear. Uh, and so I think it's worth investing in programs that, uh, that, that, achieve, uh, that achieve those outcomes. Uh, I'm not so sure that the research indicates that it's worth, uh, that the return on investment is either as large as people think it is from looking at uh, uh, the, the uh, calculated returns for Perry Preschool or Ab Abercedary, and I, I, I don't know if the returns will be uh, positive in terms of uh, education outcomes for the typical program that's delivered for four-year-olds. And I think, you know, as we get into the policy debate, it's always, I think, a mistake. It's, it's attractive to advocate based on the most positive numbers you can come up with. It can be a mistake when the evidence comes in and disappoints people with respect to, uh, to an oversell. So, you know, expecting um, modest improvements uh, from public investment for children in greatest need, I think, is a very reasonable expectation. Uh, thinking that we're going to close ac achievement gaps at age 15 or that uh, the nation's going to spring back to the fore of international assessments because we invest in, in, a, in a preschool program for four-year-olds seems to me uh, um, unjustified. So Sarah and I differ a little bit, I think, on, on what the evidence suggests about the returns, particularly returns for investing in everyone in the universal program. We also differ, I think, a bit in um, what the federal role uh, uh, should be, and I'll come back to that now as I launch into my plan remarks as opposed to uh, uh, the debate remarks. So I want to, 1996, it's August, um, I was in a Head Start Center in Bellport, Long Island. Uh, there to meet with parents to convince them to uh, participate in a research program uh, we were running. I showed up early. I saw uh, a mother show up with her uh, with her four-year-old or soon-to-be four-year-old and an infant, and she was in uh, the parent meeting. Not a lot of parents there, maybe six or seven, so she asked a question. And as I was packing up my car to drive home, I saw her leaving uh, the Head Start Center. She's got uh, her four-year-old in hand. She's got her infant uh, in a stroller. She's got an arm full of materials the Head Start Center had given her to get ready for, uh, for enrollment of her child in September, and she's walking along the road and it's hot. So I stopped and asked her if she needed to ride home. She accepted, she got the back seat. I thought I was taking her a couple of blocks. I took her three miles, dropped her out off in front of a very dilapidated house. And uh, before we said goodbye, I said, gosh, you know, uh, uh, it's a long way to walk. Did you walk to the Head Start Center? Her answer was yes. Uh, six miles uh, on foot, why did you do that? And her answer was, I just care about my babies. And for me, that has been a touchstone uh, ever since. I mean, wh what are we talking about here? We're talking about something that's important. We're talking fundamentally about families and uh, their concern for their kids and, and, and their welfare. And uh, actually, the, the Head Start Center I was in then, I didn't think was doing a particularly good job. So it struck me that here is a woman, you know, walking literally the extra mile to get what she needs. And uh, the public service wasn't as good as she, as she deserved. So there are things here, I think, that this is an important debate. It's an important issue and one that I think we need to do right. Well, let me talk about the federal role and what I think it ought to be. Uh, I come at this, uh, I mean, when you, when you ask what is the role of any government agency or any public service, uh, y you're really talking in part about governance philosophy as opposed to uh, in empirical findings so they can come together at points in time. So what, I think, what do I think the appropriate role is uh, in, in education for the federal government at, uh, at any level? I think it's first to provide uh, financial assistance uh, for uh, disadvantaged families whose needs are not going to be efficiently or reasonably cared for at the local level because of, for example, concentrations of poverty, the inability of a tax base in a state or a community uh, to deal with the needs of those, uh, of those families. And to do that in the preschool area uh, involves three, I think, uh, reasonable federal rationales. One is school readiness. So the nation as a whole uh, benefits or suffers depend on the education outcomes of, of, the, of the children in the nation. And so the national government has a legitimate concern in seeing that the education system performs well and to the degree that school readiness is important to the overall outcomes of the education system. It's a, reasonable, it's a reason to invest in the preschool education of uh, kids whose families otherwise are not going to be able to afford that. Um, there are, um, I think, an issue that's often left out and uh, uh, 
could be important for advocates of, uh, of preschool uh, is the issue of uh, women and uh, their ability to enter the workforce. Uh, one of the things that uh, preschool programs do, whether it's, and, and federal pre preschool programs do, whether it's uh, Head Start or the Child Care and Development Block Grant, is enable women with young children uh, to enter the workforce. Uh, that's important to them. It's important to the nation in terms of uh, uh, reducing welfare uh, cost. Uh, and it's presumably uh, important for the communities in which they work. So I think that should be part of the equation. We can think about early preschool not primarily uh, or not exclusively in terms of the benefit of the child, but we can think about it also in terms of benefits to the economy and benefits to participating uh, women. Uh, and then uh, th th there's simple equity. Uh, we had an event over at Brookings uh, two weeks ago uh, with representatives from the Nordic uh, countries talking about preschool. Uh, one of the things they entered into the conversation, which I thought was interesting, when we talked about inequities in this country, they said, well, you know, in Denmark we would say, that's just not fair. <laughs> <laughs> and so there, is, there are issues of fairness here that I think uh, need to be considered. Uh, families with $100,000 of income can afford preschool. Other families can't. I think that's an issue we need to address. So uh, financial assistance is uh, first got the federal function. Second is information. Uh, we need both research information on what constitutes high-quality high uh, pre-K, but we also need information that can support uh, uh, parents as they're shopping for pre-K pre services. In some ways, uh, pre-K is like higher education in that there's a lot of choice, but very little information to inform that choice. And so parents are making a choice of something that's very important, and they're doing it blindly, or they're doing it based on a conversation in the grocery store with some other parent. Uh, I think the federal government has a role, uh, either directly or through incentivizing states, in making more information available in the quality of particular preschools in terms of uh, uh, staff preparation in terms of the satisfaction of parents who've been served there and in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the test results that kids get once they transfer into the regular uh, public school uh, system. Uh, and third, I think the uh, fundamental federal role is to establish markets. Uh, you can think of it as what the federal government does in almost every sphere of its activity except education. So the Federal Communications Commission is concerned about making sure that there's competition in the wireless space. Uh, aviation, we want to make sure that markets are not too concentrated, that people have choices, and that markets are informed by information uh, and so that they're more efficient. And so I think the federal government has a fundamental uh, role there. Again, it's connected with information. It's also connected with regulation that assures uh, uh, minimal standards are being met for the quality of programs that are being uh, purchased with, uh, uh, with federal funds, and it includes parental choice. And so for a market to exist, you have to have consumers. Consumers are parents. Uh, I think the federal government has a fundamental role in seeing that parents can shop with information for preschool, uh, preschool services. Uh, how should the, those federal mechanisms be uh, federal responsibilities be mechanized, if you will. Uh, I'd like to see uh, uh, an expansion and improvement of the Child Care and Development Block Grant program, which is the funding program larger than any other federal program that directly supports the purchase of uh, child care and pre-K services by low-income uh, parents. It's done essentially through a voucher system. I'm in favor of that. It has almost no quality controls, I'm not in favor of that. So one way for the federal government to go would be to put more of its resources into something like the child care development and grant program and establish along with that uh, minimal requirements for the types of services that parents can purchase, uh, can purchase with, those, uh, with those vouchers. Uh, I think the federal government has a role, again, in establishing markets. The way to do that is to incentivize states to uh, regulate uh, uh, child care provision and to provide information for parents through information portals, portals about what they're likely to get when they put their child in a particular pre-K program or child care program. And finally, I think the federal government has a, a significant job to undertake in providing some coherence and consistency to its current 
funding efforts. Depending on who does the math, there is from 20 to $25 billion annually invested by uh, the federal government in a variety of uh, child care and pre-K services. Uh, different rules, different regulations, different federal agencies involved, different recipients. It really is a mess. And as the federal government takes responsibility, as the president has indicated he's going to do, takes greater responsibility for the quality and provision of pre-K services, it should start by cleaning up its own house and making sure that those considerable resources are directed and regulated and focused in ways that are likely to achieve uh, the outcomes that are intended. And finally, uh, for any uh, entity, uh, whether it's the federal government, uh, state government, uh, uh, city government, to think about what it's doing, it needs to articulate what it is it's trying to accomplish. What is the problem that we're trying to solve here? Is it access? Is it quality? Is it school readiness? Is it uh, greater opportunities for access to the workforce for uh, uh, parents of young children? Uh, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? And strangely, I haven't seen that issue as part of the current public debate. Debate. We start as if we've walked into the middle of a cocktail conversation, and uh, we didn't hear the beginning of it. But we're ready to follow through and talk about, you know. Uh, what the federal, how much money the federal government should invest or whether it should uh, eliminate Head Start or what it should do. To what end? And I think that needs to be part of the conversation here. So to get back to, to, uh, to Mike's questions, targeted versus universal. Uh, targeted, we don't have enough money to go around. Let's invest it where we know it's going to have the biggest uh, effect. Uh, Head Start. Uh, Head Start provides a service, but I think uh, states that are willing uh, to uh, take on this, uh, this issue can do a better job with the money. So I'd si like to see Head Start funds uh, shifted to states uh, who are willing to accept considerable responsibility for providing a coherent uh, service. The federal role, the federal role is to let states, localities do their job and to give parents a greater ability uh, to carry out their fundamental responsibilities. Okay, great. As we said before, this is not your typical stupid pre-K debate. This is a very high-level one and uh, some great comments so far. Let's do a little bit of, of rebuttal here and back and forth. I have a couple questions. Uh, Sarah, Russ talked about the child care block grant, improving uh, some quality control around that. Do you find that promising as well? So it's an interesting question. I mean, I think the thing that Russ and I definitely agree on is that the quality in that program is I mean, there's very little quality standards, and if you go in some of the centers where these kids are, you literally want to grab the children and run screaming out of the building because they're so bad, and um, and it's really unacceptable. I think that, um, and we actually have evidence that kids whose parents are getting CCDBG actually do worse than kids whose parents aren't. Um, so, and that's one of the reasons why when we look at Head Start, we should say, if the one federal program is actually hurting the kids, and Head Start is some evidence helping them, we should maybe give more credit to Head Start than we do. I think the issue with CCDBG is one, you know, it, it's a program that serves the entire gamut of child care needs. So children up to the age of 12 who need aftercare as well as infants and toddlers. When you get into the infants and toddlers, there are just some really complicated economics there that sort of distort everything in that it, it just doesn't economically make sense in a lot of cases to be serving infants in institutionalized child care settings, but we have, for a whole host of reasons related to not providing maternity policies, um, created a dynamic where there's tremendous economic harm to women and families if they don't put their infants in these settings. And if we could have a more rational and less polarized discussion around that, I think we could serve the entire system of kids a lot, a lot better. Um, and, and then I think the issue just, it, it, it gets very complicated. There's a reason the standards in CCDBG are so low right now, because it really was designed as a way to support women getting off welfare to be able to work, and because states have historically had an incentive because they don't want to invest resources beyond what the minimum they have to is in keeping the quality as low so they can serve as many of the people and get people off welfare as they need to. And there are real trade-offs with increasing the quality standards in terms of what those costs are and you know how you do it in a way that doesn't 
push a lot more people into sort of unregulated informal care they're not paying for. Um, you know, 38% of families with kids under five and a working mother are paying no money for care. Some of those are great situations with grandma. Some of those are really terrible situations, including self-care and kids getting passed around between a whole bunch of other adults that we know are not bad, are not good for kids at all. And so trying to do that is really complicated. It's a very, it's almost a much more ambitious strategy than trying to enact universal pre-K in some respects. Well, you know, except uh, this is a federal program and we're talking about the federal role. Universal pre-K is not a federal program. It's something presidents talked about incentivizing um, and actually jumps ahead in the conversation, but he's actually not suggesting that at all. So I, I know it's complicated, uh, but if the federal government is going to focus on improving uh, quality, improving access, making sure that uh, it achieves uh, goals of, uh, of, of, of school readiness and uh, safety and availability, why not start with its own program that's providing the most money and distorts the market in its own ways by, uh, uh, by, by the incentives it provides for parents and states to uh, shop for cheap services and mm -hmm. to spend no more than is absolutely necessary to get the job done. So I understand it's complicated both technically and mm -hmm. politically, but it seems to me something that uh, very much needs to be done. And I will be surprised when the administration uh, actually tells us what it intends to do, which will come in the form of, uh, of, of its next budget request when we see it, I think. Uh, I'll be surprised if this is not part of the administration's plan. I All right, mean, let's it talk is part of what they've already said to some extent. Uh, I don't know what it means in dollar terms, right? So. All right, let, let's talk a little more before we jump in the president's plan on, on the evidence. Uh, there is a term that has not yet come up yet, which I'm surprised about, namely fade out, right? That in these debates uh, we talk about, especially on the right, People will point out often that uh, any benefits you see in these programs tend to fade out over time. By the time you get to third grade, it's hard to see uh, that these long-lasting benefits, at least in Head Start and many of these bigger programs. So let me start with you, Russ. I mean, when, when you, you, you made it very clear that you think we can expect perhaps modest, uh, modest outcomes from these programs. Um, but what about the fade out issue? I mean, have we really figured that out? Can we point to any large-scale programs that have proven that they can have long-lasting impacts? Uh, some programs show fade out and some don't. And uh, uh, so if you look at uh, Abracadarian and Perry, the two early, uh, more or less well-designed, randomized and executed randomized trials, in which the participants have been followed up into adulthood, uh, you'll see that when children were tested as they moved through elementary school, uh, uh, sure, the effects weren't as big as when they were tested when they entered school, but effects were still there, uh, cognitive effects. For Abbasidarian, uh, the cognitive effects existed at every testing point uh, through and including the, the follow-up when the participants were 30 years, 30 years of age. So the idea that an early preschool program that has as one of its intentions enhancing the cognitive development of children is necessarily going to uh, demonstrate fade out. So its uh, effects will be uh, not demonstrable in elementary school is simply not consistent, uh, consistent with, with the evidence. The, the most powerful programs generate both uh, economic benefits in, in, in adulthood by uh, greater employment rates, but also demonstrate academic uh, benefits uh, in, in between. So when we look at Head Start, which not only does not uh, generate effects that persist to third grade, but does not generate effects that persist to kindergarten, you have to ask whether it is a, it's having uh, an impact that is as large as we should expect. And my conclusion is it is not. Uh, so. so, Sarah, what, what gives you confidence that large-scale programs, unlike these you know, tiny little hothouse programs, can, can overcome this challenge? I mean, because we've for one thing, we've seen two of them do it, right? I mean, we now have results through third grade in New Jersey, and we have quasi-empirical or quasi-experimental study from Texas showing kids having sustained gains into third grade who participated in those pre-K programs. And Texas pre-K program is the exact opposite of a hothouse program. I mean, it's a huge program, the biggest in the country, and the resources that they spend are, are not high. So if we see those two states doing it, I think it can give us some confidence that it's possible. It's not universally happening, and the fact that it's not showing up in the evidence for Head Start is a big 
concern that mm-hmm. that requires improvement in the program. I think we need to also make sure we're looking at both what's going on in those programs and what's happening once those kids get to school. One of the big overlooked issues in this space is how do you actually align what's happening in pre-k with kindergarten and how do you share data between those systems as kids are moving along so that the kindergarten teacher is able to build and so that the first and second and third grade teachers are able to build in a trajectory over time Um, one of the challenges for you know the most free-flowing market version of this is that it makes it much harder to do that if you don't have the right structures in place Okay. Can, I, can I just follow up? I, I mean, the nice thing about the Texas data, which are recently released, uh, for, at least from the, from the point of view of the argument I've been making publicly, is that this is not a universal pre-K program. It's a targeted pre-K program. It uh, invests in, uh, uh, through school districts in low-income kids, and yet we've got, uh, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, good evidence of, of impacts through, uh, through fourth grade, uh, and the strongest impacts for the, for the highest-risk kids within the low-income group. Uh, uh, Children from non-English-speaking Hispanic families profit tremendously from the early pre-K experience. We've got Georgia, which is uh, uh, a model of a universal pre-K program. Uh, Good follow-up evidence on that that suggests uh, very, very small uh, impacts in strange places like white kids in uh, (laughs) non-urban areas. So it, 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 it makes it important, I think, to to talk about universal versus targeted. If you want to do that in the context of the evidence, we have some evidence that targeted works and not a lot of and evidence that universal may not uh, achieve much. There are also those significant program and support designs between those two states that are somewhat relevant to that conversation, which is probably too wonky of a conversation to have in this environment. But I mean, you know, you have things like Texas School Ready, which has done a really powerful job in improving instruction and improving teacher quality across the programs in Texas. You don't have similar things in Georgia in terms of in terms of sort of a concerted effort to really make sure programs are doing what makes a difference for kids in terms of learning. Yeah, the follow-up data in Texas is from a from a cohort uh, f- far that that ex- that went through the Texas pre-K program <coughs> far bef- far before Texas School Ready. Uh, it existed, so I'm not sure that uh, I, okay. I, I don't agree with you. All right, let, let me ask one more question, then we'll get into the president's plan. Uh, the quality, right? I mean, Sarah, you were saying that we know it works, we just haven't had the will to do it. I mean, it always seems like in any of these debates, uh, K-12 or pre-K, all we have are hypotheses. We're talking about little kids, and we're trying to figure out what do they need so that someday, you know, they're going to succeed in life in a variety of ways, or at least, you know, where they're going to succeed in school. Many of us in the reform world would say it's, it's school readiness, it's pre-literacy, pre-numeracy. Uh, Ed Hirsch would say it's vocabulary, content, a real curriculum. Uh, but there's some people, Deborah Kenny in the Washington Post the other day talked about the importance of play-based uh, preschools and kindergartens. I have my own kids in a Waldorf school, which my son Nico explained to people, I go to school where we don't learn anything, uh, <laughs> which is pretty accurate, <laughs> as at least on things you can measure. Um, he does get to play with wooden toys, uh, which is cool. So the, the question is, you know, how do we define quality and are we confident? I mean, you know, we, we had this big discussion this last year about grit and other non-cognitive skills, right? That suddenly we're saying, hey, maybe that stuff's more important than we thought. Um, are we so sure that focusing on the academic development of little kids uh, is actually the right way to go? There's certainly lots of upper middle class parents who don't think that's the priority. So I think this is one of the stupid debates we have all the time. And um, if you want to understand why this is a stupid debate, Jack McCarthy from Appletree is sitting right there. After this, go up to him. Find out when you can come and visit his preschool in southeast D.C. or in northeast D.C. or in southwest D.C. Um, And you will see an environment that is doing everything that we need to do to prepare kids to succeed academically when they get to school in terms of rich language instruction, exposure to rich content, vocabulary development, building pre-literacy and pre-math skills, but is also doing it in an environment that is full of joy and love and play. Those kids are having fun and is also fostering their social emotional development and is very strategically doing both of those things with an intense degree of planning, an intense degree of constant assessment at both the teacher and the child level to inform instruction. Um, I mean, this is 
kind of rocket science in the sense that like there's lots of things that have to happen and have to be done very strategically but when it's actually executed well it looks like a seamless and wonderful environment for kids and so these disputes we have about academic versus social emotional or about whether kids should be playing versus learning are like total garbage okay but sarah (laughs) okay so you're saying, you know, both and. Mm-hmm. Okay, but Jack's programs go from what? Nine to three? Five days a week? No, it's eight, from eight to six. Eight to six, five days a week. Eight to six, five days a week. I would imagine that's not typical for preschool programs, right? That if, I mean, is that, I mean, my, my assumption is that many of these preschool programs are much shorter. And so you may have to make tougher decisions about how do you spend that time. But it's not necessarily, I mean, so one, a lot of these kids are in preschool programs that are also being used as childcare where their parents work, so they actually are in for that period of time, and that's one of the challenges that we need to think through about how we finance these programs and what the public versus the family role is. But, but two, it's not an issue of we spend some time doing play and we spend some time learning, or we spend some time doing social emotional and we spend some time doing language and literacy. The reality is it's how you're delivering all of that in terms of how you're how you're using your time and how you are thinking about building language interactions with the kids into the teacher playing with them and being very strategic about how you're doing that. If you go in again, you know, not to bring up Texas School Ready again, but um, they are very focused on planning and teaching the teachers how to plan and how Mm -hmm. to use the time well. And they're doing this in half day programs. Do they, given that they're working with much smaller amounts of resources and smaller time and frequently lower qualified teachers get the same results as Jack does? No. Do they get good results for kids? Yes. Okay. Russ, anything on that front? Do you agree with Sarah? Um, Stupid well, debate? I, you know, I, I think there are two, two questions embedded in, in, in your question. Uh, one is, do we know what is the best environment uh, for young children in general? And uh, in the context of a pre-K experience. Uh, and I think we do not. I think we oversell substantially uh, what we know uh, about, uh, about preschool development and how that maps on to educational experiences. There are vast differences around the globe in developed countries in terms of the nature of the pre- preschool experiences they provide. In uh, Finland, for example, first three years of life, uh, maternal leave, paternal leave. Parents stay home That's with their true. kids. Well, <laughs> the Finnish person two weeks ago claimed it was true. Uh, uh, <laughs> Denmark, 92% of the kids uh, are in organized child care by 12 months, uh, 12 months, 12 months of age. They have very different models of how to serve uh, uh, the, the needs of, of young kids. We've gone from very small participation in pre-K programs in this country in the 1950s and 60s to 70 to 80 percent participation for four-year-olds, uh, four-year-olds now. Uh, should you send your kid to a Montessori school or a school that has a lot of academic content in it? Hmm. I can't, you know, if, if, if you want to pay me a $250 consulting fee to give you that <laughs> advice, in the end, I'm going to say, I, I, you know, I, I don't think there's an evidence base <laughs> that allows me to claim that the Montessori is better or worse than this, uh, you know, uh, academically oriented preschool. So, uh, you know, I, I think we we need to allow for a lot of choice. We need to understand that for lots, most kids are well buffered <laughs> against a variety of developmental experiences. If they've got a warm, secure, and supportive relationship at home and some opportunities to learn, they're going to be okay. Uh, and so I think when we focus more on, I, I, th- I do think we know what's bad for kids, <laughs> and the evidence is pretty clear, uh, pretty clear on that, and we need to avoid that. But I don't think we need a one-size-fits-all uh, definition of uh, a, a pre-K experience. To the other question, I think that's embedded in Mike's comment: uh, Should we separate out, uh, you know, a, a emotional and social development from uh, cognitive development? Does that have to happen? at one time of day versus another time of day. No, I agree, that's, that's stupid. If you're going to, uh, to introduce uh, uh, you know, a, a planful cognitive curriculum into a preschool setting, if you know what you're doing, it is going to be joyful. It is going to be engaging. Kids are going to be having as much fun with uh, 
uh, rhyming games as they can have with Play-Doh. And if you've turned it into something else, uh, you don't know what you're doing and your license ought to be taken away. All right. Nice. Glad that Play-Doh got a shout out in here as well. <laughs> Everyone drink your, drink your juice boxes. Okay. Uh, finally, to the president's plan, uh, why don't we talk about this briefly? I say briefly, what we'll get to this is because uh, so many Washington insiders don't believe this plan is going to actually come to fruition because of gridlock in Washington. But nevertheless, Sarah, uh, tell us, what, what did the president get right in this proposal? Uh, anything that he got wrong? Five minutes, please. Um, I'm not sure I, I have five minutes worth of stuff to say about it. Five we, minutes or less. We don't yes. know that many <laughs> of the details, right? Um, so I, I think the things the president did get right are sort of the framing of providing a high quality early learning experience to all four-year-olds as something that should be a national commitment and a national goal and something that should proceed starting from a point of school readiness and starting from a point of equity for low-income kids. And I think the other thing he got right is that ultimately states need to play a major role in any kind of strategy to get there. And so the proposals that they've put forward are, you know, at least starting with low-income kids um, and are putting states as, as the primary partners and the primary folks responsible for the actual execution of, of this stuff um, in terms of how it would get done, not the feds going out and educating your preschooler, as some people have suggested. I think sort of when we get beyond that, there's just a huge amount of sort of questions in play about what we're actually talking about here and, and what it would actually look like in the actual funds. And without knowing sort of more about that, it's, it's difficult to say. I, I do think it's interesting that sort of the first – um, four years of the Obama administration, the early childhood po policy was much more focused on this sort of early learning challenge, which was really much more some of the sort of systems and like overall broad child care quality stuff that, that Russ was actually talking about. I mean, a couple times you sounded like conversations I had with people about early learning challenge there. Um, and this does seem like a little bit of a shift towards more of an emphasis towards what do we really need to do to provide an educational experience for four-year-olds that is more like our public school system and enables them to succeed in school. I don't think they're abandoning the other policies, but it is an interesting shift. Okay. Russ? Uh, I agree with Sarah that we don't know enough yet about what the president actually uh, intends uh, to accomplish to, uh, uh, for, for me to be able to say for sure what I like and don't like about it. So part of this is, uh, is, just, uh, is just surmise based on what, policy, what the president said. I will, I will say that it, it is, there are two messages. One was the message in the State of the Union and the speech given later that week in, in Georgia, in which the president talked about uh, you know, his, his aspiration that every parent in America would have available to, uh, to him or her a uh, you know, high-quality pre preschool experience for, for that parent's child. And the actual details of the, parents, of the president's plan as released in a two-pager the day after the State of the Union. Uh, it's a means-tested plan. Uh, the, the administration would provide uh, some degree of matching funds for states if the state would agree to provide a high-quality pre-K pre experience for four-year-olds for free uh, for parents uh, no more than 200 percent of the poverty line uh, for a family of three in this country. It's about $40,000 a, a year. So the administration's plan is a means-tested plan. Uh, president's rhetoric is a universal plan. We'll have to see uh, how those two mesh as we go as we go down the line. I like the means-tested plan. I said I'm for targeted programs, so it makes sense to me that the uh, federal government would would make we would be making its investment uh, its investment uh, there. Uh, president talked about uh, and the White House uh, follow-up to Pager talked about uh, measuring outcomes. I think that's important. We need to be careful about what outcomes we measure. <laughs> you know, if it's just going to be uh, knowing letters of the alphabet, uh, I, I think we will probably distort uh, preschool experiences un in undesirable ways. But I think it's fair if we can't measure everything. It's fair to know whether kids who are showing up in kindergarten who have been in organized settings do or do not know basic things that they're expected to know when they enter kindergarten. And it would be reasonable, I think, to assess on that and have that, uh, have that information uh, available. 
Uh, the administration's plan is uh, focuses on states, and I think that's the right place. I, I don't want the federal government running its own pre-K programs, and so I'd rather have uh, the federal government partnering with states to, to do that. What don't I like? Uh, the administration's two-pager said that, uh, you know, for states to sign on to this, they would have to agree to uh, provide uh, well-trained uh, pre-K teachers who would be compensated at the same level as elementary school teachers. Hmm. Uh, that means uh, that uh, those teachers would presumably have to be credentialed the same way as regular public school teachers are. There's no way to justify the common pay scale without a common credential scale. So what we're buying into here is uh, schools of education now being in the business of credentialing uh, four-year graduates for pre-K. Uh, very little evidence that those kind of credentials do any good uh, in, in, in K-12, K and pretty good evidence that they're not important in, in pre-K. So we've got something here that's going to drive up the cost, uh, three or $4,000 per child, and I think it's just, uh, it's just a mistake in, empirically and a mistake uh, uh, politically. Looks like the administration wants local school districts in charge, so we're going to put in charge the very districts that are failing kid, kids in K through 12, and they're supposed to fix it in pre-K. Uh, we need a variety of providers. We, I don't think we want to make uh, uh, monopoly school districts, monopoly providers of preschool uh, education. Uh, danger here of standardization uh, through mandated standards and curriculums. Uh, a curriculum, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure we're to, I'm sure we're not to the point that we know enough to, to be assertive on that. And again, I'm not clear yet about what the administration intends to do with its total federal investment. And uh, if it's just uh, uh, playing a, a game on the side here and leaving the rest of the system unchanged, uh, that will be a mistake. Sarah, can you address that question about credentials? Sure. I mean, well, before I get to that, I think I'm glad you said some of what you were saying was surmised because I think that sort of idea that there would be a lack of choice and that school districts would be in charge is, is somewhat of a surmise yeah, and not exactly. a reflection of anything the administration has actually yeah. said. I, I would share deep concerns about either of those approaches. Um, you know, in terms of the, the teacher qualifications and credentials, I mean, sort of Kevin Carey and I have written fairly extensively about this that with I think there's a pretty good evidence base. I, I do sort of disagree with some of Russ was saying about we don't know enough about what kids need. I think we do have a pretty good understanding of some of the types of things that good preschool teachers need to do to enable children to, to learn and the types of experiences. I don't think we know that much about the specific auspices or how exactly it has to be delivered. But there are certain things kids are not that different that adults need to be behaving in radically different ways. Um, there, there's some pretty clear evidence about what good preschool teachers need to be doing. Um, that said, sort of, you know, we know that a lot of current preschool teachers are very, very low skilled, very, very low paid, and don't actually have the skills or the knowledge that they need to do that work. I think the solution from some parts of the early childhood community has been we need everybody to have a bachelor's degree and we need to move towards the kind of credentials that we have in K-12. I think our experience in K-12 education suggests that mandating the credential doesn't actually get you there in terms of individuals' actual ability to execute what you need them to do. And I think there are lots of reasons to be concerned about the capacity of our existing higher ed systems to prepare people um, with the kind of preparation that they need. And so what you know, what Kevin and I have proposed and what we're seeing people start to grasp onto around the country, um, and we're seeing some good models in different places, is creating some new pathways using some of the higher ed reforms that are underway to help early childhood educators, wherever they are, access the kind of training that's really pegged towards what they need to know how to be able to do and what the kind of knowledge they need is to provide a great learning experience for kids. Some of that is improving just general knowledge and skills for some very low education people, but there are also very specific techniques and strategies and how you structure your time that people can be taught and can learn. We need to be sort of focusing on those pieces as opposed to sort of going down uh, sort of rabbit hole around bachelor's degrees and credentials. So, yeah, so Sarah, let me, be, let me be clear. So do you, you think that we can get where we need to go mostly with our current pre-K workforce? I think that's an open question that we don't have enough information to know about. My 
hypothesis would be that we can't get there entirely with the current workforce, but it's very important that we include strategies to help some of the current workforce who have dispositions and cultural knowledge of the kid's own culture, but don't have the education or skills to get there if they have the ability to do it, but that we also need to be looking at other pathways to bring um, a variety of talented people in the field, not just as classroom teachers, but also leadership is a big mm-hmm. gap in the early childhood space right now. Uh, let, let, you know, if you put all these pieces together, and you know, Russ was talking about welfare reform earlier, right? I mean, so we have created this incentive for these m- young mothers to go out and get work, uh, many of whom are fairly low skilled. And some of the work that they have gotten has been as these pre-K instructors, right? And so if we then create ways to then push them out of that workforce, Right. I mean, it, you know, so so the point is, you know, you know, it, how do we how do we make all these different pieces fit? And, you know, it, you know, that that early education is one of those prime jobs that seems to be something that these, you know, mothers who otherwise would have been on welfare are going into. So you're saying that you do think that we can provide them some training to help them stay in those kinds of jobs. But you need some additional people as well. Is that is that Russ? Does that sound about right to you as well? Or? Well, I, I, I agree uh, strongly with Sarah that we, we, the current, the skill set of the current workforce in uh, daycare and pre-K settings is pretty low, and it needs to be improved. And I agree with Sarah that we know some ways to improve it. Uh, these do not tend to be uh, uh, particularly high cost. Uh, there's some online training, for, for example, that's been shown to be very effective in raising the uh, quality of the interactional skills of, of, of pre-K teachers. So we need to invest in improving the quality of the workforce. Um, the way to do that is not to insist that everybody have a bachelor's degree, which is a way to drive up the cost and not necessarily achieve the intended outcome. In general, over time, I think uh, all parents would want what I, as a parent, wanted when my kids were in pre-K, and that is that they be around the smartest, most caring adults possible. And we're probably going to have to pay more in the long term to attract uh, people into the field that have those, have those characteristics. And we should be thinking about in making those investments. But again, that's not the same thing as having a BA degree and having a traditional uh, credential, and we can't. If we try to get there from here, you know, by uh, through that route, uh, it's going to to not work politically, and I don't think it's going to work functionally. Okay, we are going to open it up to the audience, both here live and also online via Twitter. Again, those of you watching online, you notice on questions to hashtag pre K debate. Uh, we have gotten some in advance. Uh, McCoy Education Consulting had sent a question about the credentials, which we've pretty much covered already, asking about the bachelor's degrees and whether we can afford that. Um, let, let me start with uh, Susan LaMontagne at Fingerwag. Um, and the question is, how long should a quality pre-K program last? Is two hours enough? That's what you see in some places. So we talked about uh, Apple Tree's, you know, great 10-hour uh, a day program. Um, you know, do, do we know enough to say that you need to, you know, we need at least X amount of hours a week for this stuff to be effective? I don't think you can, I mean, it depends on the child. Uh, so a, a, a child who is getting uh, what he or she needs at home uh, doesn't need to be in an organized uh, child care setting for eight hours, eight hours a day. Uh, the parents may need or want the child to be there, and that's <laughs> a separate issue, and it's not one I, I put aside. But the child doesn't need to be there. We know from... Uh, uh, studies uh, sponsored by NICHD that long hours in organized pre-K settings are negatively correlated with social behaviors in, in adolescence. So kids are more likely to act out and have problems. This is a correlational study. It's not an experimental study, but you know some reason for concern that extensive hours outside the home are, at least for some kids, not good. So you know I think you've got to look at individual children, what their needs are, what they know and what they don't know before you could possibly try to specify a dosage that would be appropriate for a particular child. 
Okay, we had a question here. Yes, in the leather jacket. Uh, wait for the mic. Tell us who you are. Ask a question. That's not a speech with a question mark at the end. Yes. I'm nowhere talented enough to make a speech. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm Michael from Education Writers Association. My question is, um, you know, if, if the administration moves forward with, um, with an early K program, and if there's disagreement on what kind of setting is ideal for, stu for um, students, is there the risk of prescribing things um, that may or may not work for all students and sort of you know, offering this prescriptive approach that cuts off other worthy ideas of how students should learn in an early case setting? Mike, I'm shocked that you would think the federal government would prescribe things at the state and local level. So is that I, a risk? I think sort of theoretically that's a risk with anything you would ever do where you would try to set any standards. I think in practice when you look at how most states have moved forward to implement pre-K, in general those pre-K programs use diverse delivery. So it's not just that every kid is in the school district. They're coming up with ways to incorporate community-based providers. Charter schools are delivering pre-K in a number of places faith-based organizations for profits are sometimes part of those systems as well and and so so I think that diverse delivery piece is very much part of how most states are doing pre-k not everywhere but it's part of the place and and there there are huge variations in the extent to which states are ensuring that those programs all meet the same standards or not I think so Russ raised a question about curriculum and um, I don't think anybody is proposing that the federal government or the states mandate a specific curriculum for all programs. I, For one thing, politically, I don't think that would ever fly anywhere and the feds can't do it. Um, but I do think when you look at a state like New Jersey, um, where they you know, have evidence that the kids are sustaining learning gains that last into third grade. They did not mandate a curriculum, but they did mandate that all the programs have a curriculum. And they did a lot of work to help programs, particularly community-based pro programs, understand what a curriculum is because one of the key issues is being intentional and making sure kids get a set of experiences that prepares them for school readiness. A lot of child care centers today don't actually know how to do that and so providing some guidance around curriculum and in some cases helping those programs select some kind of curriculum that can help them guide that can be a valuable tool in getting them there. Uh, it, it would be a tremendous mistake for the federal government to uh, be prescriptive uh, in, in this area even in the sense of providing very strong strings attached to the federal matching requirement. It, it, it would be a mistake politically, and it might well be a mistake in terms of the effects on kids. I mean, these decisions should be made, uh, you know, as, as close to the parents receiving the services as, as possible. So, you know, if, if the federal government wants incentiv to incentivize states to work out their own plans that have some coherence around them, fine. But to say, you know, we're you, to, to get the federal money, uh, you have to have standards that assure that children know A, B, C, and D to get into school is not the way we, uh, we need to go. And I would be very surprised if the administration uh, went in that direction. Okay, we've got a question from Twitter. Uh, Stephanie uh, Gross, say, I don't exactly know, uh, evidence of benefits based on access to high-quality programs. So the benefits are these we, we don't know how to scale at K-12, scale quality, so what makes us think that we know how to scale quality in the pre-K space? Well, we don't. <laughs> if, 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 if the questioner means how could we take, uh, how could we take something like the Abracadarian program, uh, you know, 100 kids, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, uh, you know, uh, f famous people ran the program, full-time pediatrician, how do we take that? which cost roughly $100,000 per, per child. How do we take that program and scale it up for Missouri and assure that we get the, well, we don't know how to do that. Uh, but we do know that uh, programs that don't look so good on paper, <laughs> you know, like the, like the Texas program, I don't know, $3,000 per child or something like that, is, is having a positive impact on, on kids. So what we should attend to is not how we take a hothouse program and scale it, but how we take the programs that are being delivered on the ground and put in place a system for continuous improvement and monitoring so that they get better. So it's like K-12. We do know how to scale mediocrity. Yes. 
and uh, that's better than nothing. I mean, the other okay. thing I think we need to do is, you know, there are different providers providing these programs, and some providers are better than others, and we need methods not just for facilitating continuous improvement, but for looking across and saying, which providers are doing a good job? How can we either help them grow to serve more kids or help them partner with other providers so that those providers can learn from them and get better? And conversely, how do we raise the, the floor on quality by identifying the worst providers and getting them at least out of the business of receiving public subsidies. I, I agree with that. My only addition would be that, you know, I, I would hope that market mechanisms are part of the process of weeding out the poor providers and incentivizing uh, the better mm -hmm. providers to grow. And if we let parents shop, uh, I think that's one way, not the only way, we need regulation in this area, but one way to uh, achieve uh, better outcomes. You know, if you want uh, the best deal on a cell phone, who should you ask? You should ask a low-income person. <laughs> They've shopped. They can tell you how they get the service I'm paying $100 a month for for 25, for 25 bucks. Uh, people can shop if they're given some information and have an incentive. And parents want to shop. <laughs> For, for the pre-K experience their kids are getting. We just need to empower, and to empower them to do that. And I think in doing so, we can achieve some of the outcomes that we would otherwise try to achieve through top-down uh, regulation, which uh, has its has inherent risk. I think, All right, but that, I think but Russ has a little more faith in the power of the market here than I do. I mean, there's a reason that I can go into Ward 8 in D.C. right now and throw a rock and hit an abysmal child care center that I would not allow any child I love to be in. And it's not that parents are not functioning in a market. It's that the market is not delivering quality services that parents want to buy at a price those parents can afford. And if we want to solve that problem, there needs to be some kind of public or societal role in, in helping to address that, both through floors and through sort of supporting parents' ability to access the kind of services they want their kids to be in. At the other end of the spectrum, when you talk to affluent parents who are trying to purchase preschool or childcare services for their child, the level of sort of frustration and either I can't find it or I've been waitlisted at every place or I found it but I have absolutely no idea if it's the right place for my kid to be is incredible. And if, you know, those parents can't navigate this market, you know, to their satisfaction, we have a real problem in the market and there is a role that the public can play in fixing that problem. Some of it has to do with providing resources and subsidies. Some of it has to do with providing information. But I think some of it does have to involve actually strategically building supply where the supply is lacking. Right. I mean, these are not, I, th I think uh, these are not incompatible. So, uh, you know, having, a, having a, a societal role, a governmental role in dealing with uh, uh, breakdowns in, in the market, uh, insufficient supply and other things are, 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 are things are indoors. But at the same time, uh, providing uh, parents with information that allows, uh, allows parents to make reasonable choices, informed choices, I think is very important to what we need to accomplish here. We need it just as much in post-secondary, where you hear affluent parents very frustrated about how they're going to get the kids in school and what they're buying when they get there, as you do in the pre-K market. And I think that it is a public role to assure that people who are making choices, which we both agree will continue to be part of the system, people making choices have the best possible information on which to, to predicate the important decisions they're going to make. All right, and now, but in, 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 in Sarah and Russ, yeah. in, in, the pr in the charter school world, we've talked now a lot about supply response, and we say, okay, we, it, it hasn't happened in many places. It didn't, you know, in, and so there's been efforts from philanthropy often sure. to help make it happen, and so we've got the Charter School Growth Fund out there identifying high-quality charters and putting money into their replication and helping build up these charter management organizations. I, is there anything like that happening right now in the pre-K space? And, and why not? I mean, that seems if, if you're a philanthropist out there and you want to have an impact, it seems like doing something like that to take, say, apple tree to other cities or to, uh, you know, is that happening today? There is very little strategic work around building quality supply in the early childhood space now, and I think there are two primary, three primary reasons for that. One is simply that 
building quality supply is contingent on an adequate funding stream that is reliable year to year for quality supply and people who want to be quality providers looking at that space are looking at the space and saying that funding stream doesn't exist why would i do this i'm going to you know go focus on growing my charter school into high school instead um, the second issue though i think is that the philanthropy around early childhood has been primarily focused on policy and systems building, and those are really critical things. Systems in particular are one of the reasons that we have this fragmented $20 billion and we don't know what we're getting for it and you can't combine them easily to serve kids well. But if we don't simultaneously work to build quality supply, we will have these systems and they won't produce the desired results. And then I think the third thing though is just that sort of there's no mindset around the need to create quality supply in how we've been having these conversations and it, it's simply a piece that hasn't been there. Okay. What about for profits? They know how to scale. There are some for profits in this space. Uh, you know, is is should we be treating them equally? I mean is the is the Department of Education uh, when does the administration when they come out with a proposal, are they going to treat for profits equally? That would be unusual for this administration to do so. Uh, what, what's your take on that, uh, Russ? And then Sarah, yeah. should for profits be a part of this picture? Uh, uh, Sarah may know, maybe more confident of the number I'm going to give you than than, than I am. But I, I believe about 75 percent of the providers of, of services for uh, for four-year-olds are uh, get their get their money or, or through private sources, through tuition, uh, and, and they're private providers, some for profit and some, uh, you know, the, the, the local church. Um, th 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 there's no way the administration is going to get from here to there by freezing out 75% of, <laughs> of the suppliers, uh, suppliers in the market. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sure the people who are thinking about this in the White House must have thought about, uh, uh, must have thought about that. Uh, there should be no bias against uh, for-profit for providers in this space. I've, to, to be able to wring a little profit out of an, organ, out of an operation that uh, has so, li so little income flow, flow suggests certain efficiencies that we all could all, could all learn from. So okay. I, you know, I, I think the standards here have to be around general standards that comply to, uh, to all, uh, all providers, not to just one segment of the market. All right, great. Next question. So just to be clear, for-profit providers are already part of CCDBG and Head Start and a lot of state pre-K programs, too? Yep. Okay, so yeah, they, they're definitely still in the mix. Okay. Yes, sir. Good morning, Alan Gutman, and pleased to meet Sarah and White, Mr. Whitehurst. I've read both of your works. Um, two quick questions, and the one is not a hypothetical, which is that if we had children coming into kindergarten, and there was a huge uh, achievement gap, and by second grade, that gap had closed. But by sixth grade, the gap had opened again. Would we go back and look at that second grade teacher or the first grade teacher or the kindergarten teacher, sort of making an analogy with sort of going back to Head Start to sort of look to see how that gap opened up again by third grade? And then the other thing, and I think you're both kind of speaking to this, You've got the systems piece and what needs to be organized there and, and all of the advocacy that happens there. But how do we get to that quality piece? How do we get to the individual teacher that looks like the teacher in the Waldorf school? How do we incent those teachers to be in those schools where we have children that really have greater need? Um, how do we get that quality? And I think some of the assessments that are out there and some of the tools we use to evaluate and even to quote, educate at the college level, uh, as much as said, it's not, what, what does that quality look like sometimes? Sometimes it doesn't look like, you know, having a certain okay. skill set. Yep. Sometimes yep. it's yep. early care in education. It has to do with having a caring set too. Okay. All right. So first question is, is, is fade out basically the fault of the elementary schools, not the Head Start centers? And second question is a little more detail on getting to quality. By the way, we had an online Twitter question about the online professional development. You mentioned they would love to know the name of that if you happen to know it. Uh, you want to take the fade out one first, Russ? We blame in the wrong party? You know, party? The, you know the, the, this argument comes out a, a lot. I mean, why are we blaming Head Start if we got good results at the end of Head Start, but we don't get good results at the end of third grade? Isn't that a problem of, uh, of the elementary school? Depends very much on wh what you think you're doing with your pre-K investment. And if you think that what you're doing 
is uh, eliminating achievement gaps, and that it, and that investment is not producing that outcome, then you have a very valid reason to say, well, you know, is this a worthwhile investment? Should we be investing it in a different way? If you think of it in the same way you would think about fifth grade, or third grade, or second grade, it does provide a very different perspective. And it's part, I think, of uh, the issue I was trying to raise when I said, you know, overselling what we're doing here in the context of, you know, a $17 return for every dollar invested, uh, I think distorts our conversation about what's happening. And I would be happy uh, to see that children in pre-K programs are well served by those pre-K programs while they're there and provide for system uh, redesign so that what they learn there is part of what they're expected to learn going on and there's some connection between the two experiences. So I think there's some value to what you say. But again, if we think that Head Start is supposed to fix things and it isn't, then we have to rethink why we're investing uh, in Head Start. Okay. And I think we've hit the quality thing pretty hard. Anything more about how to help specific teachers? Uh, the online professional development, Russ, do you know the name of it? We can maybe post it on our website later uh, if you don't. Uh, sure. I th it's my... Uh, my teaching partner? My teaching partner, uh, uni uh, University of Virginia. Okay. Yeah. My teaching partner, University of Virginia. Okay. I, mean, I, I do want to reinforce Russ's point that I think advocates for pre-K have oversold the evidence and the impact. I mean, the sad thing is that you don't actually need these gigantic returns to make it a worthwhile thing to do. I mean, we can recoup about half the cost just by reducing grade retention and special ed placement and by, you know, some marginal tax benefits from people who work who might otherwise not while their kids are in pre-K. And, and that, you know, gets us a long way towards having it be a worthwhile thing without needing to, like, be, like, the solution to all the world's problems. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you to make a prediction, uh, Sarah, about the president's plan. Now, I, I, I'm starting to read Nate Silver's book, and he says that experts are terrible at making predictions. Okay, so I, you're probably the last person I should ask this about. Um, but uh, do you think the president's plan has any chance of getting enacted, even in a smaller form? And, and Joy at the Huffington Post wants to know uh, whether the Department of Education's staffing gaps uh, around early pre-K are going to affect the politics of getting this passed and or implemented? So I do not think that the most ambitious version of what the president talked about in the State of the Union is likely to be enacted in this session of Congress. I do not think that is because of the Department of Education's staffing gaps. <laughs> Over the longer term, though, I think when you look at other developed countries and where they are when you look at what parents want for their own children that I think it is pretty inevitable that the U.S. will eventually get to some point where we are delivering universal pre-k to pretty much all kids whose parents want it and where we're doing it through some kind of diverse delivery system that's much more state driven than federally driven but maintains some kind of federal role. I think the big question that that we need to ask ourselves is will that system be good or not and I think that if we want it to be good, we need to be looking at systems and we need to be looking at how do you build quality supply. All right, so let me be a little more pointed. I mean, it seems like, you know, the, the conventional wisdom is the House Republicans are not going to create a new program, certainly anything that feels like an entitlement program uh, right now. Uh, if the president made this a super, super, super high priority uh, and it was a part of a grand bargain, any chance of getting something? And it's a popular issue, right? People like pre-K. I mean, there's lots of things you can do in budget negotiations in weird ways to get stuff done. I have no idea whether they have a okay. strategy to do that or not. All right. Could I could could I make a prediction? You may, but uh, with the caveat that you're probably terrible at it, Russ, because you are an expert in this field. Uh, maybe I'm as good as Sarah. We'll oh, see. Yeah. We're, we're, <laughs> we'll, I'll, we'll, I'll give you that. We'll know in a few years, I guess. Uh, Look, I, I think there's a real opportunity for bipartisanship here. If A, the president is not proposing uh, new, mo new money, but rather is proposing to reposition the funds that are already invested in pre-K. And if part of the deal explicitly is uh, taking a portion of the $8 billion that's currently invested in Head Start and making that available to states who want to sign on to a plan in which they are providing uh, uh, services to at least all the children who have previously been served by Head Start plus a substantial expansion, uh, I think House Republicans could, uh, 
could agree to that. So it has, it's, it's budget neutral and it returns to states uh, a responsibility that uh, uh, conservatives have never liked, and that's the federal responsibility for directly delivering an education program. Okay. I like that. Uh, okay. Any questions from the audience? I still, I've got lots coming in by, by Twitter. Maybe you guys are sending them. I don't know. We've got one in the back here. Andy Smerick, if you want to ask a question, you need to raise your hand. Okay. Hi. Um. I'm Lisa Guernsey. I'm the director of the Early Education Initiative at the New America Foundation, and um, wherever Sarah had been. I wanted to ask about Head Start and the shift to younger children in Head Start. So we're seeing more and more that Head Start um, is actually enrolling children, infants, toddlers, and the three-year-olds, but not so many of the four-year-olds. And, and it appears, but this is where I'm just curious about your take, that the president's plan is you know, emphasizing that and continuing that shift. And what does that mean? That's a good question. Um, I mean, we have seen evidence that there are some places where as state pre-K has grown, um, Head Start has faced increasing competition and lost children, which I would argue from a market perspective is, is a good thing if parents perceive a better option and are choosing that option. Um, we've also seen places where Head Start then those Head Start centers become deliverers of state pre-K and actually combine those funds to provide a full day of higher quality care for kids, which I would argue is also a good thing. Um, you know, the, the moving down to serve more zero to three-year-olds is something that it looks like the administration is, is opening the door for and encouraging with Head Start. I think it's not clear to me that there's evidence that Head Start is actually better at serving that population of children than it is at serving four-year-olds, so I think people should be at least a little bit thoughtful about that and about the capacity of individual providers. Um, and, and then the flip side is we need to make sure that that shift is not happening at the expense of four-year-olds, that those four-year-olds are continuing to be served and ideally being served by better programs than they were before. Yeah, I think the, I, I, I read the administration's signal as uh, uh, we're going to stay in the Head Start business, but, but it's going to be early Head Start. And if we can get states that agree to provide something that it's, it looks like it's going to be at least as good as Head Start, we'll give them the money uh, to do that. I, I agree with Sarah that, uh, and if you look at uh, the, uh, the impact evaluation of early Head Start, there were impacts there, but they didn't last either. And uh, uh, you know, I, I think there, there are issues here about what needs to be done, the capacity to do it. But for me, it's a reasonable uh, political strategy on the administration's part. We're not abandoning Head Start. We're just repositioning it to serve younger kids, and we're letting uh, states take on the responsibility for uh, responsibility for four-year-olds. We do know that <laughs> achievement gaps, things like vocabulary, are strongly present by age three. And so from a research perspective, it makes sense to start as early as possible. Um, I'm just not sure we know how to do that well, and certainly I'm sure we don't know how to do that well at scale. Okay, we have time for one last burning question. Anybody here? In the back corner, yes. Hi, I'm Hannah Page. I'm from the State Education Agency here in D.C. Um, not to return to the quality discussion, but wanted to get your thoughts on the quality ratings improvement systems and um, their role in this debate. And discussion about raising quality in preschool. So I don't want to talk too much about the DC system since I know it's still evolving and parts of it are sort of secret from people like me. But um, <laughs> um, I think, you know, the QIS is based on a really good idea that I think reflects a lot of the market-based and systems thinking that, that Russ was talking about earlier that, you know, we should provide a variety of pathways and we should provide information to parents. and. That is all good, and I think there's real potential for those systems to help, you know, bring together programs under a common framework. The danger is that I think the way some of these systems have been enacted or developed in some places, they actually go farther in the direction of sort of micromanaging not particularly important aspects of program delivery in ways that, you know, one – are just overly micromanaging in some respects, and two, could actually distract programs. You know, if you can get points by doing something that isn't the most beneficial way to focus your energy for kids, um, from doing the things that really focus on what matters for kids. So I think 
these programs have potential, but we need to be really careful about whether the way we're developing the ratings really focuses on what's most important for kids, whether it maintains the flexibility of providers. And we do need to think a little bit about whether it's actually the right thing to be folding programs for you know, the full range of zero to five together with programs serving four-year-olds who I think need some much more specific and concrete things to prepare them for school that some of these systems just don't get into at all. I don't know the DC uh, system. I, I'm very wary, though, of quality rating systems that d depend a lot on inputs, yeah. uh, inputs that have questionable, if any, relationship to the outcomes we're all interested in. I would rather uh, aghast see kids tested on things we know that matter and have ob ob observers from outside preschools go in and look at the quality of interactions in the, in the preschool or watch videotapes or something to get at things that we know are important rather than, uh, you know, uh, ratios or uh, dollars spent or credentials or uh, uh, organizational framework of the of the building plan and other things that uh, people develop rating schemes around that seem to me to cause more administrative headache than anything else all right well no matter what's your quality rating system i think you would agree this was a very high quality conversation about preschool please thank russ and sarah for their great com comments I will say for you tweeters out there, there was a great conversation on Twitter today as well. Uh, you might want to go back and check that out. Uh, if you have colleagues or friends who were not able to be here or watch live, this video will be up within a couple of hours. Check it out uh, at edexcellence.net where you'll find lots of other great stuff, including our now award-winning flypaper blog. Uh, stay tuned for information about our next event, which will be to celebrate the 30th anniversary of A Nation at Risk. Thanks so much, everybody, and have a great day.